It's looking like it's going to be January before any of the top MLB free agents sign, but that doesn't mean there still isn't plenty to discuss from the last week in the baseball world. Hello, everyone, and welcome into this week's edition of Around the Bases from 110 Sports here on the 110 Sports Network at 110sportsmedia.com, as well as on our YouTube page and on Spotify and Apple Podcasts in audio form. A lot of news items from this week and storylines and developments, uh, things that maybe we didn't necessarily in the baseball world see coming this week. Uh, We had in a long overdue development Major League Baseball announcing this week that the Negro Leagues have officially been recognized as a major league. A decision, again, long overdue that means that stats and records from seven leagues between 1940 and uh, 1920, I should say, and 1948, and approximately 3,400 players will now be recognized as a part of MLB history. The league is going to be working with the Elias Sports Bureau to review Negro League statistics and figure out uh, records and figure out how to incorporate them into MLB's record books as well. Meanwhile, in a very troubling development, the Athletic reported this week that former that, that MLB is investigating former shortstop Omar Vizquel following allegations of domestic abuse from his wife who filed for divorce this year. And in another development, uh, in another news item, since the last time we talked here on the broadcast over the past weekend, the Mets have hired former senior vice president and assistant general manager of the Diamondbacks, Jared Porter, to be their next general manager on a four-year deal. So those are some of the big storylines from this week. Uh, Obviously, we're here on Around the Bases. We're not going to be able to get to every single major topic from the sport. Three things we are going to talk about in some depth today on the show. We're going to talk about the news from earlier this week that the Cleveland MLB franchise will be dropping the Indians' nickname. But there is, uh, it's, that's not going to be happening for the 2021 season. It is a complex situation. Uh, there are people who have strong feelings and emotions about this, of course. We're going to dive into this topic a little bit with some different observations and, and research and information that I think is important to keep in mind with this situation. We're also going to discuss the question, will the 2021 MLB season begin on time? Because there's been some reporting from earlier this week uh, that says that there could be some parties involved that may want to push back the beginning of the season. So we'll talk about the latest there as well. And to round out the show, we'll talk about some of the biggest off-season moves from the past week. Again, no major moves, no blockbuster trades, no JT Real Muto or Trevor Bauer signings, at least at the time of this recording. Uh, but we did have some other smaller but still notable deals this week and a trade or two. Uh, so we'll discuss those. Uh, we'll kind of go around the horn with some different signings from the week and give you some quick takes on what they could mean moving forward. But let's go ahead and dive into our first topic, and that is that Cleveland's MLB franchise will soon have a new nickname, though that soon will not be prior to the 2021 season. In a press release in which they misspelled the name of the city that they reside in, the Indians franchise announced that they would be dropping that Indians name. Team owner Paul Dolan told the Associated Press that it is time to make a change after months of internal discussions and meetings with fans, business leaders, players, social activists, and other groups, including Native American groups who have sought for years to to get the franchise to stop using the moniker, which many deem disrespectful and offensive. The team, though, will continue to go by the Indians and use the same uniforms in 2021 while it goes through the process of picking out a new name, a contrast to Washington's NFL franchise, which is currently known as the Washington football team. And we don't know what the possibilities for the new name for the Cleveland MLB franchise could be, other than that it will not be related to Native Americans, Uh, it's not going to be, they're not going to be changing their name to the tribe or anything like that. Uh, That's the only thing we know other than that. um, They're still figuring out what the name is going to be. Now, a few things here off the top. This is a move that has been telegraphed since July when the franchise first revealed its intention to review the Indian's name. And that's just simply not something that you publicize if you're not going to end up making a change. You don't announce 
we're going to review our nickname, our name as a franchise, and then come out months later and say, yeah, we've decided that it's going to stay. That's just not something that is done. So this, the writing was on the wall that there was going to be a change eventually, but it wasn't clear you know, at what point uh, there might be an announcement or a change or anything like that. Also, of course, fans of the franchise, Major League Baseball fans, as oh, broader Major League Baseball fans as well, remain, of course, divided over this decision. A large number of fans applauding the move as a necessary step forward. A vocal portion of the fan base remains staunchly against it, and many even clinging to the Chief Wahoo logo, which the team retired prior to the 2019 season. So there are a lot of different directions we can discuss this important story in the baseball world. But what I wanted to do is just bring a couple of different aspects a couple uh, to this story. And, and one is first some historical context. Cleveland's baseball team became the Indians in 1915. So it's been 105 years. But when, it be when they became the Indians in 1915, it was their fifth nickname in 15 years. And... It was never supposed to last very long. When the nickname was selected, this was what was written in the Cleveland, uh, the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Quote, a new name had to be selected for the Cleveland American League Club. President Summers invited the Cleveland baseball writers to make the selection. The title of the Indians was their choice, it having been one of the names applied to the old National League Club of Cleveland many years ago. The paper continuing, quote, the nickname, however, is but temporarily bestowed as the club may so conduct itself during the present season as to earn some other cognomen which may be more appropriate. The Indian's nickname was never supposed to last. It was temporarily bestowed. And that has been the organization's nickname for the last 100 plus years. ESPN's Jeff Passan wrote a very, I think, interesting and and compelling story uh, after this news broke and he noted that over the past 50 years no fewer than 15 colleges in the United States have dropped the nickname Indians in favor of a nickname which is less polarizing and found that they were able to continue on just fine with a new nickname after dropping the Indians nickname and I, I also one thing I, I sort of really found interesting about Passon's a column, I guess, if you will, that he wrote for ESPN. Again, I rec recommend it. He addressed the idea of the uh, the groups of fans, of Indians fans, of Cleveland's MLB team fans who uh, were upset with this move. And he wrote, Fandom is so full of emotions, so jam-packed with memories, so replete with associations that taking away a name triggers an emotional response of loss. It registers to some like the thievery of those emotions, memories, associations. It is a direct assault on something near and dear. Passon continued, it is also just a name. And perhaps the best way to explain what's happening is that the Indians are dying so Cleveland baseball can live. Sure, they could have remained the Indians, drawing the ear of Commissioner Rob Manfred, running the risk that advertisers might abandon them, standing on principle to protect what, exactly, Passon wrote. A brand that was perhaps irrevocably broken? It's easy to understand why Washington and Cleveland did what they did, uh, did what they did now. The nicknames were toxic goods. That's ESPN's Jeff Passan earlier this week, and I think an important, uh, important read, important portion of that story that he wrote to consider. And here's one other thing I want to bring up about this, this news. Again, this is a thing we could talk about for an extended period of time, and people, of course, are, uh, but it's hard to, you can't be all-encompassing and discussing this in, in about 10 minutes or so. But here's one thing I want to bring up, and it's a disconnect between what we have heard for, uh, from the front office of the Indians, from their ownership, and what they're actually doing. And there was nowhere where this was more clear to me than when I was reading uh, the article of the exclusive interview that the team owner... Pat, uh, Paul Dolan gave the Associated Press. So when that story came out, these two sentences were back to back. The first sentence was, in an exclusive interview with the Associated Press on Monday, Dolan said, quote, the name is no longer acceptable in our world. The very next sentence of that AP article, Dolan said the team will continue to be called Indians until a new name is chosen. 
So basically, what their team owner was saying there is we this is this is what they're saying is he's they're saying it is their view that the name is offensive and inappropriate and that they should not continue using it, but they want to use it one more year. At least it, it appears that from the reporting it's going to go through at least the 2021 season. Seemingly because of the cost that it would take that would be involved to change it right away and the other process things that would be involved. But if that's really what this decision was motivated by, if the organization really believing that using that nickname is no longer acceptable in our world, then why would they not go the route of the Washington football team, for example? A, a team who made that decision to drop their nickname and sort of got this whole process started. It's hard to reconcile what the owner is saying with what the team is actually doing. Because if they're saying that it's an inappropriate term to use in our world right now, but we're still going to use it for another year, that just does not square. And I think that's something that should be kept in mind as well. That the explanation here doesn't quite add up. Eventually, uh, it, does, it doesn't add up at all. Between there, There's a disconnect between what the organization is saying and what they're actually going to be doing. So the Cleveland baseball team, the Cleveland MLB team, is going to be known as the Indians. They're going to go by that nickname, continue to go by that nickname for at least the 2021 season. And then after that, at some point, uh, they will be announcing a new nickname. As far as what that new nickname could be, uh, there's been a lot of different suggestions and things thrown out there. The Spiders is one that I've heard a lot, uh, but uh, that's one where only time's going to tell what direction they go with their new nickname. So a lot to discuss on that issue and uh, this, on that topic and it just barely, we were just barely scratching the surface there, but I recommend uh, you do some reading, read what Jeff Passan had to write, read uh, what Hannah Kaiser had to write for Yahoo Sports. I think that was a really uh, interesting uh, article as well. So check those out for more information on that. Our next topic though that I want to discuss here today on the show is a bit of a here we go again. And it is a potential, another conflict potentially in the making between Major League Baseball and its Players Association when it comes to the 2021 season. Now, this whole thing got started on Tuesday when USA Today reported that MLB executives and owners want to delay the start of the 2021 season until May. And their rationale, at least as according to the reporting from USA Today, is such that players can be vaccinated before arriving to spring training. Unsurprisingly, the Players Association has very different thoughts on this matter, uh, believing that the season should begin in April after the teams uh, showed last season that they can adapt to safety protocols. Now, first off, I should say the idea of wanting players to be vaccinated before beginning the season is not at all absurd. There's, of course, going to there's, of course, the Players Association would say they think they can do it uh, by following protocols and then uh, changing those protocols as needed throughout the year. But the idea of wanting players to get vaccinated before playing base, before starting the year is not a crazy thing. Obviously, there'd be much less, much less risk. It'd be much safer. Uh, and it seems possible that the, the, that the delay of about a month could leave enough time for players to potentially be vaccinated. That's something that doesn't seem like, given what we know right now is happening across the country, doesn't seem like that's something that would be possible for players to get before reporting to spring training at a normal time uh, in mid to late February, but it maybe could be something they could have by mid to late April, as an example. Um, sorry, mid to late March, I should say, instead of February, uh, so that they would be playing uh, by early May. But the thinking from MLB executives, at least according to this reporting that we've been reading, seems to be that this would lead to, starting in May, would lead to a shortened season, likely 140 games or even fewer instead of 162 like normal, which conveniently would lead to owners having to pay players less of their contracts. They would not be making the entire amount of their contracts. And the league's track record for years on this and then the negotiations that happened over the past summer, frankly show us what baseball's the ownership's real goal is and that's to save money they they want to save money and that it it you know happens to fall in line that yeah if, if you don't st if you only play 140 games and you start the season late 
later, you're not going to have to play the players as much money. Now, it's been reported that some players have expressed a desire, uh, that expressed a willingness, at least, to wait and push back the season a month, and if need be, like baseball executives apparently want, but then they were, there's the idea that, well, okay, let's play another month, let's go longer so we can still play 162 games, let's just shift the season basically a month. Something that seems pretty reasonable. There's also the idea of, okay, we can get to 162 games if we do seven inning double headers. Both of those suggestions, though, according to this reporting, baseball is not a fan of, which kind of, again, shows you where their priorities lie. Because it seems like, you know, there, there may be players, many players, groups of players who say, let's start the season normal, let's do a normal season as much as possible in terms of timeline. And then you have others say, okay, well, we can push it back, but we still want to play 162 games. And let's just make some adjustments to get there. And owners apparently aren't a fan of that, which, again, kind of shows you what it is they really are prioritizing here. So here we go again, two months before pitchers and catchers are scheduled to report at this point, and we have no idea, quite frankly, what exactly is going to happen. Uh, and I've seen today big league managers have said uh, today and in recent days that they have been told to plan for a normal spring training and said that some league executives have expressed optimism that there could be normal uh, spring training camp openings uh, at the normal time. But, of course, that, that doesn't mean a whole bunch as well because you have to plan as if things are going to be normal in that regard in terms of timeline until some other agreement would be reached. So that doesn't necessarily mean a whole bunch. So, I mean, I've seen takes from throughout the week, earlier in the week, people saying, well, it looks like it's probably not going to be spring training starting on time. Which, again, in and of itself isn't necessarily a disastrous thing if there's a plan in place, but there isn't a plan in place for any sort of a change. And maybe there doesn't need to be a change. Maybe they are just going to start in at the normal time. But if there is going to be a change, that's going to be a negotiation between the Players Association and the league, which could lead us to another stalemate. It's, there are all sorts of other things that need to be worked out between the two sides this offseason. You have the collective bargaining agreement, which is set to expire after next season. You have uncertainty about the DH, as we've talked about here on the show, uh, the Universal DH and the National League. There's just It's another factor that could lead to more negotiations, more factors of uncertainty thrown into this offseason. And look, this is the kind of thing where I'd love to say that maybe there's a chance we just get a resolution on this soon and that sides come together and they figure something out. But it seems like just another thing that's going to be thrown into the pile of things that need to be negotiated between the players and the owners potentially and sort of just kick down the road of the offseason weeks and weeks into the offseason as we approach January. It's unclear whether the MLB season is going to begin on time. It seems like everyone is in agreement that there's going to be a, you know, a pretty extensive MLB season, whether it's 130, 140 games or regular 162. And it doesn't sound like anybody's suggesting that, you know, hold off to start the season till July. But even if it's relatively small differences, it's going to lead to conflict. It seems like it may already be leading to conflict. And it's one of those things where, again, it's just, it's, going to be only time will tell but it's another factor that's just going to make this off season uns add, add even more uncertainty as i've already said to a very uncertain off season all right final major topic of the day as i said no top tier free agent signing but uh, we have had some signings and a couple of trades over the past week or so since we last talked. The biggest one since the last episode of Around the Bases uh, would be the Mets signing catcher James McCann to a four-year contract uh, worth reportedly about $40 million, which is a pretty pretty good payday for James McCann. Obviously, he's not of the level of JT Real Muto, the top catcher in baseball, and of course, he's a free agent this offseason, but McCann has been one of the better offensive catchers in the game in recent years in a pretty small sample size. Just two years ago, James McCann was non-tendered by the Detroit Tigers, not a great team at the time, and it just in terms of on-the-field results. And they non-tendered James McCann. He wasn't known as a great defensive catcher. He was showing really no life at the plate at all as being any, any sort of a plus contributor offensively. 
since then, uh, he has you know played in two seasons with the White Sox, not two full seasons. The first year especially, he was a backup. He's played in 149 games over the last two seasons. He's hit 25 home runs. He's hit 276. He's really become a plus, you know, especially when you look at those numbers, you're not super inspired. But for catcher, you have to change your offensive expectations. Among catchers, he's been one of the better hitters over the last few seasons. And he's also made significant defensive strides as well. Now, I think there's no denying that you look at that $40 million price tag for James McCann, and you say that seems like a bit of an overpay. And yeah, there is some risk involved for the Mets. But they needed a catcher. Aside from JT Romuto and James McCann, there aren't a lot of guys who you're confident with as starting caliber options who you think are a real plus, other than just being a guy. There really aren't many of those at all. So unless you're going to swing a trade as the Mets, it's it's kind of one of those two guys. And apparently, Sandy Alderson, their team president, said that they had, of course, been in contact with JT Romuto's representatives, but it seemed like he wasn't going to be signing for quite a while, and they just wanted some certainty. They needed some certainty so that they could come up with the rest of their plan. So they go out and they sign James McCann to a four-year contract. Yes, there's some risk involved because he has doesn't have an extensive track record as a great hitter, and it's a four-year deal. $10 million uh, annually he'll be making roughly, and that's that's a good chunk, but it also leaves plenty of room for the Mets to make some bigger moves. There have been heavy rumors about them with Trevor Bauer, but especially with George Springer. It seems like everyone seems to agree they're the favorite to sign George Springer. So, of course, the, the move for James McCann doesn't prevent them from spending significant money in other places. If the season, the offseason ends and James McCann is somehow the Mets' biggest move, that would be a very big disappointment for their fans. But there's no reason to expect that's going to be the case. Because again, like I said, all the top, very top tier free agents pretty much are still available. So the Mets have the resources. They're not putting in that much annually towards McCann. So if he's the second or if he's the you know third biggest move they make this offseason, of course, that's a completely different story. That means they've had probably a pretty big offseason, as many expect. A couple of other moves from this past week. Uh, the Texas Rangers signed outfielder David Dahl, who was non-tendered by the Rockies, to a one-year deal for worth around $3 million. Uh, we've talked about Dahl before here on the show and in, in writings and stories that I've written. Uh, he has been hurt a great deal over the past few years, but he's shown some great potential when healthy. In 2016, he hit 300, 302 with 15 homers. In 100 games, he got a spot on the NL All-Star team. So certainly a worthy gamble for a Rangers team that could certainly lose, use some thump in their lineup. The Red Sox, meanwhile, added some thump to their lineup with the addition of outfielder Hunter Renfro on a one-year contract. Uh, that's worth roughly $3 million as well. The 28-year-old was recently non-tendered by the Rays. He's been a pro prolific power hitter. Between 26 and 33 home runs for three straight seasons, and then he was just really bad in 2020, 156 with eight homers, and the Rays non-tendered him. So he joins the Red Sox, who are dealing with some uncertainty of their own, with Jackie Bradley Jr. now a free agent. Uh, it's possible he could return, but adding Renfro, adding Renfro to the mix in the outfield certainly helps. Meanwhile, speaking of the Rays, uh, the team re-signed catcher Mike Zunino to a one-year, $3 million deal. Uh, the 29-year-old spent the last two years with the organization. He's a plus power contributor, low batting average catcher with good defense, and he uh, is now back with the defending AL champion Tampa Bay Rays. Meanwhile, the Giants signed right-hander Anthony Desclafani to a one-year deal worth around $6 million. Uh, his, 20, uh, his 2020 season was really bad, a 722 ERA, but he opened the season on the injured list came back, never quite figured it out, and it seems like it could be a, a very fluky situation for him. He was a solid mid-rotation arm in 2019, posted 3.89 ERA, 167 strikeouts, and 166 and two-thirds innings, so he now joins the Giants and their rotation. Veteran reliever Greg Holland is back with the Royals on a one-year $2.75 million deal. He'll likely be their closer next year and help contribute to a pretty good-looking bullpen for the Royals. It's going to be an interesting team to watch next year. They've, of course, signed Carlos Santana as well. Uh, so not a team I'm expecting to compete that much in 2021, but certainly a team to keep an eye on as they continue to progress in their rebuild. Some other moves for relievers made this week. The Angels signed Alex Colladio, left-hander formerly of Milwaukee, and also uh, 
Keenan Middleton uh, was signed, a longtime Angels reliever was signed by the Mariners. The Cubs signed right-hander Jonathan Holder, formerly of the Yankees, and the Rangers. They added some bats in recent weeks, but they also dealt primary their primary closer from 2020, Rafael Montero, to the Mariners for a pitching prospect and player to be named later. So those are your notable moves from the week, especially those later ones that I mentioned. Not particular, particularly huge needle movers, um, but still notable, of course, the James McCann signing, the biggest really of the past week, which or the past few weeks really, which kind of shows you how slowly this off season has been moving right there. Uh, you know, it looks like at this point, like I said at the top of the broadcast, it's probably going to be January, maybe even mid-January, uh, before the top free agents, your Trevor Bowers, your George Springers, your JT Bermutos end up signing. ESPN's Buster only reported, or he tweeted today, that the average MLB salary last season was $4.4 million. And 15 of the 24 deals signed this offseason so far have been for $3.1 million or less. So teams are not shelling out big dollars. Again, no huge contracts. Even you know the biggest average annual value contracts that have been handed out have been like Charlie Morton for $15 million for one year. We haven't seen teams willing to commit big dollars for several years outside of like the James McCann deal. And that's not even that big compared to what we should be expecting from the other other players yet to sign. So it seems like it's going to be a while. There's just so many factors that are slowing down this offseason, so many decisions that need to be made between, negotiated probably between the league and the Players Association that it seems like there's no immediate resolution on those coming. And in the meantime, many players are probably going to wait for some certainty before they sign, and teams as well. So I imagine this offseason is going to continue to move along at a snail's pace, unfortunately. But we'll keep an eye on it over the next couple weeks. You never know. Uh, it could be a situation where one big move is the first domino, gets things moving. But that is going to do it for this week's edition of Around the Bases here from 110 Sports. Thanks so much for watching and listening today. Make sure to check out 110 Daily. It's streaming live on the 110 Sports Network on our website, on Twitch, on Periscope, on Twitter through Periscope. Uh, you can check that out every weekday from 10 a.m. to noon Eastern. And also check out all of our content at 110sportsmedia.com. You can subscribe to our newsletter on the right side of the homepage for all of our latest coverage sent to your inbox every Friday afternoon. Make sure to check those things out. Uh, we'll be off here on Around the Bases for the next week or so, assuming nothing huge happens because, of course, uh, it is the holiday season. Uh, Christmas coming up uh, just over a week away from this recording and then New Year's. So uh, we'll be off here from broadcasts of ATB for a little bit, uh, but I'll talk to you again soon. So thanks so much for watching and listening again. Stay safe and have a very happy holiday season.